Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you about our SBIR program today. Oh, don't leave. Come back. Uh, I just got started. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I'll get to, the, uh, get to my presentation. Here's the agenda for my talk today. First, I, I'll give you, give you a quick overview of SBIR STTR program. And I'll go through some of the SBIR stats. I get asked a lot about our statistics, and I, I think you'll probably find this very interesting. Uh, and then I'll go through, the, through our org chart ju briefly just to show exactly where, how our SBIR fits within the, SB, within the NSF. And then I'll talk about the program specifics. So SBIR STTR program. STTR, SBIR program, they're a congressionally mandated program. So all the federal agencies with over $100 million of extramural R&D budget are required, required by law to put aside about 3% of that money specifically for this purpose, for the SBIR program. The goal, can you hear me better? Okay. So the goal is to promote innovation, promote technology-based economy within the country. And to do that, we provide funding to for-profit companies to develop innovative technologies and commercialize. Not a lot of people realize this, but the SBIR program actually started at NSF. Back in 1978, it was launched as a pilot program. And with the success of this program, became a law in, I believe, in 1981. And now um, we have about 11 federal agencies that participate in the SBIR program. STTR program was, was added in 1992. So NSF, we are primarily a funding agency with about $7.5 billion budget, annual budget. And yes, we do fund life science companies. And some people, for some reason, get kind of confused and surprised with, uh, with us funding life science companies, but we do. And our SBIR programs, we are the only group within the agency that works primarily with for-profit companies. And our annual budget is approximately $200 million. And we fund approximately 400 companies each year. I'm sure many of you have seen variations of this diagram over the years, but on, the, on your left side is where uh, basic research takes place, usually uh, on, at a uh, academic or federal lab. Uh, the goal is not necessarily to commercialize any intellectual property, but mainly to, uh, to generate some data, public, make some publications, and uh, add some specific knowledge to a, to a field. And if they do see some commercial potential within the, with some of these IP, the university typically files for a patent application. And uh, if there's sufficient com commercial potential, it, there's a company that gets spun out of it. And on the right side is, uh, is the commercialization side where investors typically come in. Companies are able to raise money through these investors. And in some cases, they're able to form strategic partnership and grow the company. But in the middle, what most people refer to as the valley of death is where the problem arises. Companies die because of lack of funding. And we see our role as kind of filling that gap as much as possible. Our phase one, phase two, and phase, and phase two B, uh, all, when it's all said and done, it's about $1.5 million, and we hope to fill that gap. And, and we realize that for most of the life science companies, that's not going to be sufficient. Hopefully, that'll give put them in a better position, better position to go out and raise more money through other investors, or maybe even uh, get some other grants through other agencies like NIH. So our SBIR STTR program, phase one, goes up to $225,000. It's a six month to a 12 month project. Companies typically decide how long it'll take for them to complete that project. Phase two goes up to $750,000. It's a two-year project. And we have a phase 2B, which we pretty much match uh, two to one. So every $2 that companies are able to raise through investors or generate revenue, commercial revenue also counts, and you can use that as part of the match. And we will, for every $2, we will match a dollar up to half a million dollars. 
So it does add up to about 1.5 million. And unlike NIH, unfortunately, uh, you have to go through one at a time. When you're submitting your application for the first time, you can't go directly to a phase two. You can't do an accelerated program. You do have to go through phase one. And then uh, upon successful completion of phase one, you can move on to phase two and then to B. So SBIR versus STTR. Uh, STTR, uh, I mean, they're pretty much the same thing, except STTR has this collaboration requirement. Companies do have to form a collaborative relationship and under a, some sort of legally binding cooperative research agreement, they have to uh, work with the university. At least 30% of the money has to be budgeted for the university or a nonprofit uh, group to get the work done while they put, a, put aside about a minimum of 40% of the money for, for themselves. And the SBIR program, the requirement is that two, the two-third of the budget has to be put aside for the company to, to use and, and advance the technology. I get asked a lot about, well, you know, do I have a better chance if I apply for SBIR, or STTR as opposed to SBIR? We do treat them exactly the same way. Uh, within the same panel, we sometimes have both SBIR and STTR applications. So uh, just because a, co a company applies under STTR instead of SBIR, uh, they don't get funded when the project would not be funded under normal circumstances under SBIR. So we do treat them separately, uh, the same way. Uh, so whatever makes sense for the company, you should go along with that. If you work very closely with the university and, and can use a university as a subcontractor, then they should go ahead and submit it uh, accordingly and potentially submit an STTR application. So here is our program stat. This is for the past three years. For phase one, roughly 16% of all applicants were approved. Phase two, it came out to be about 39% of the applicants getting approved. The little box on to your right side is our statistics for the year 2015. We had 271 uh, phase one companies that we awarded. And of these companies, the median number of employees was three. The median age of the company was just one year old. So these were all very young. And about 70% of these phase one companies were receiving grants of any type for the first time. And some, some of our portfolio company statistics, about 15, 10 to 15 phase two companies do get bought out every year. And many of our phase two companies do receive significant, do raise significant amount of money after going through our project, roughly $60 million cumulatively per year. So our SBIR program, we do go beyond uh, just providing funding. We do provide uh, some training and mentorship to our companies, just like NIH does. Uh, and it's an opportunity for companies to get connected with uh, other companies as well. And winning an SBIR program does signal success to investors and other strategic partners. We had a company not long ago that came in for a phase 2B presentation. All the phase 2B companies actually do have to come into our office and, and do an investor's pitch. And their investor was actually on the phone calling in from Japan. And the guy was saying that the main reason that they decided to put money into this company was because the company was vetted by NSF and funded by NSF. And that prompted them to actually do some additional due diligence take this company seriously, and ultimately invest in this company. So sometimes having this money, uh, I mean, it's good that you can uh, some, make some technical progress, but it also helps you to raise additional downstream financing. So here's our org chart. Uh, there are nine directorates within NSF. Our SBIR program falls under uh, engineering. Directorate. And within engineering, we are under the Industrial Innovation and Partnerships Division. Within this division, we have SBR program in the middle, well, all, the, all the topics and the name of, names of all the program directors that are in charge of the, uh, the topic. And on, on the left side, you may have also heard of I-Corps program, which was also started at NSF. 
And that's also within our division under academic clusters. And what does not show on this chart is the contract staff to your right side. It show, shows up as just one box, but we have just as many contractors who help us with, the whole, all, with all the logistics, uh, with bringing in reviewers, making all the arrangements. And so without them, it would not run as smoothly as, as we do. And, and uh, we will not be, we probably will not be able to uh, review as many applications as we do annually. Some of the program specifics. Uh, I'm sure the NIH, uh, although I wasn't here, uh, presentation went over this, but to be eligible for SBIR, you have to be a for-profit uh, business within the country uh, that's 50, 50, at least 51% owned and controlled by individuals in the U.S., meaning U.S. citizens or permanent residents. And the federal definition of a small business is still very big, 500 or fewer employees. So technically, you can have 100 employees and still be eligible to apply and be considered for SBIR. But as you saw earlier, uh, when you have that many employees, it, it's generally not a good thing, and it does work against you because we see ourselves as a, as a group that provides seed funding for early stage companies. And as you saw earlier, the number of employees is most, most of these companies are in the single digits. So that's, um, but these, this is a qualification to be eligible to apply for SBIR. So difference about SBIR program at NSF. When people talk about SBIR, they, I think people also kind of throw around the term uh, federal, federal procurement. That gets thrown around a lot, and people talk about how they can get federal procurement, and that's a big advantage. Unlike other agencies, uh, NSF does not buy anything from our companies. There is no internal research within NSF, unlike NIH. So there is no specific technology that we want to see and potentially bring in. We're interested in funding companies with all types of innovative technologies. And you did see the list in our org chart as well. And companies pretty much defined, uh, define uh, what the market need is and tell us what their innovation is. And we'll just take it from there. And depending on which topic it fits under, uh, we will review accordingly. In fact, the last review cycle that we had, the, the previous deadline that we had in December, we had another topic called other topic. So companies, can, if they can't find the, the right topic for themselves, then they can just apply under that topic. And so for that reason, finding the right topic to apply to is, uh, is not as important as following the solicitation and putting together a strong application. When your application comes in, we do look into it, and we sometimes pass it around. Sometimes you may apply it under a certain topic, but it may get passed to another topic because we saw that as a better fit. So what do we fund? We love innovative technologies, proprietary uh, technologies, and um, this is probably one of the few places that you'll hear uh, people wanting to fund high-risk technologies. Most of the investors out there, they want to go out and find something that's low risk, but potentially high return. But we do like high risk technologies with, uh, that are very early stage in development. And as you saw from, uh, from our phase one stats, uh, majority of the phase one recipients, uh, they are receiving money for the first time. And uh, hopefully that'll help them uh, be in a better position to raise more money after completing the, completing the project and grow the business. And we also look at com significant commercial opportunity. Because there is no internal research, uh, we, what we want to see, uh, we, I mean, it, it's great if the technologies, uh, technology works and it's, uh, it's uh, important for that particular field, but we do want to see that the, comp the technology has the potential to succeed in the market has big enough market potential, and the company understands what it takes to make it work, grow the business, and turn that into a success. So what do we not fund? Well, we don't fund basic research, and we typically don't like incremental improvements of existing products. 
And when people talk about disruptive technologies, I mean, it, I think that term gets, I mean, gets used a lot, but you really don't see that many companies with truly disruptive technologies. So I think in, in some ways, we do fund incremental improvement, but, um, but if it's just an incremental improvement of something that's already, that already exists without much of an impact, then it does kind of uh, take, a, take a back seat versus a company that has, uh, has a bigger potential in the market. Uh, projects, it, even if the technology itself is really interesting, if there is no customer uh, to grow the company with, uh, then uh, those are the type of companies that we do not want to fund. And we do not fund market studies. All of our money pretty much gets used for achieving technical miles, milestones. So here are some of the logistics. Applications, written applications are uh, required to be submitted through our online website. The solicitation is published about three months before the deadline. So for phase one, the deadlines are June and, and December of each year. So for the next deadline, uh, if you look at our website uh, sometime in March, that's when our solicita solicitation will be published that details everything that's related to that next deadline. And we do tweak it a little bit. So it's really important. We do have our current solicitation that we provided for the December deadline. It's really important to go look at the current solicitation because um, even just within last year, we allowed companies to submit up to two applications per PI. Now it's down to one. So we do tweak it a little bit. So it's important to get the latest solicitation that talks specifically about the deadline that's coming up. And we do treat all the documents um, as confidential info. It does take us a long time. We, we are kind of trying to shorten that a little bit. Four to five months, I realize that it, it's a long time, especially for early stage companies. But with the number of applications that, that we deal with, and for us to give a proper consideration to each application, it really, uh, it's difficult to make it, turn it into a faster deadline. I used to handle, um, with my previous employer, uh, about anywhere between 10 to 20 per month, and I was able to just turn it around and have a decision done by, and made by within two months. But uh, with the December deadline, I have, right now I have about 100 applications, and as I get the proper reviewers to come in, give us feedback, and then I go out and do some additional due diligence on these companies, and it's very difficult to make that uh, much quicker than four to five months. Companies can expect to start the project in about six months. So if companies that submitted their application in December, they can expect to start their project uh, June 1st of this year. Stre strengthening the uh, SBIR application. So stressing the importance of innovation with significant impact, that's important. Although we don't require supporting data to go along with the application, at minimum, there has to be some strong evidence that the technology works as intended. Uh, we are using taxpayers' money and we don't want to be throwing money away, so there has to be something, out, something there that says this, the technology, uh, really there is enough, enough evidence that the technology works as intended. Understanding the market, how, how the company might be able to uh, penetrate the market. Although at phase one, they're still developing, understanding, for example, how the regulatory process works, what they may have to do to get the approval. Uh, just showing that they understand how that works uh, goes a long way and it'll help them strengthen the application. Support letters are always nice and we do allow, for phase ones, we do allow up to three support letters. So if you have any potential investors, strategic partners, um, or potential customers uh, interested in your technology, getting a support letter from them is important. And, and there are definitely different degrees of credibility and with each of the letter. Uh, I always tell companies that it, it's great when a company comes in and says they have this really exciting technology and they can make a big impact. Uh, but I think the story does flow a little better if they have a letter 
from, say, a strategic partner that says it's very interesting, and if the company is able to do A, B, and C, then we're willing to sit together with the company and have more in-depth discussion about how we can work together. And the company comes in and says, that's exactly why we plan to do A, B, and C with this money. I think the story, I think it's, it's, a, it's a better story and more credible story. Uh, strong management team, uh, at this stage, we don't expect companies to have the full set of management team, but at minimum, if you have any managerial gap, it's a, always a good idea have, to have some people on your advisory board that can fill that gap until you're able to bring somebody in full time. Communication with our program directors is strongly encouraged. So as you go through the process, if you have any questions, all of our contact information is on our website. So we do encourage you to email us and call us and um, having a discussion uh, will not only help, uh, help us understand you better, but it'll also help you to, to be, I guess, in a way more visible as we review your application. So here are some of the key, key takeaways. Uh, our SBIR money, it's seed funding for high-risk technologies with high ret ret potentially high return. Focus is on commercialization. Even, even at phase one, it's important to show that you understand how to, uh, what, what the market looks like, what your initial target market looks like, and how you plan to penetrate that market. We are not a customer. We will not be buying anything. You pretty much identify the market need. Tell us how you're going to uh, grow your business. We only fund research uh, R&D work and any additional work that you need for potentially for patents or accounting or marketing or other purposes, you'll have to uh, raise that money separately. Pivots are okay and actually for most of the companies, uh, we expect that some sort of pivots will happen as you try to grow the business. But if a company is trying to pivot because their plan A didn't work, uh, that's probably not, that alone is probably not a good idea. And if it's uh, based on the customer demand, for example, that's, uh, that I think justifies that this pivot is absolutely necessary. Uh, and don't stress over the submission topic. Again, we do pass it around after you submit. So um, just concentrate on following our solicitation and putting together a strong application. And, and I, I, I have actually seen some companies uh, applying to NIH to this. Uh, the phase one application says uh, $225,000, and they'll submit an application for a million dollars. And um, if you did that with NSF, you will be turned away. You'll have to wait until the next deadline to submit your application again. Uh, so it's very important to follow the solicitation. Same as NIH. Okay, so I had one company that told me that they were able to get the full million, so I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, and communicate with us, that's important, and start early. And this is very important because in order to get some uh, market research, do some additional, um, get some additional information on, on the specific target market, your marketing strategy perhaps, and support letters from potential customers or investors, those things do take time. So when you start early and start putting, preparing your application, you'll start to see what else you might have to do to strengthen it. And by the time that you're able to submit it, you'll not only have met the deadline, but have, pre have prepared a strong application, uh, and hopefully uh, it'll be approved and you'll be able to, uh, to uh, make progress. With that, thank you. That's my contact information on the bottom. And I don't know if I'm supposed to... I don't know if I'm supposed to take questions, or is that it? We have time for questions. Is there any, any questions? Yes. My understanding is that uh, as the traditional SCIR doesn't uh, cover a clinical trial costs. You said R&D, would that include any new exam? Yeah, typically what we, what we tell companies is that if they do need to do clinical trials, I mean, we would be more than happy to help develop their platform. But for clinical trials, we refer them to NIH, and hopefully they'll be able to get funding through NIH for the clinical trials. But the actual uh, 
perhaps the platform, delivery drug delivery platform, if that's what the company's working on, would be more than happy to fund that to get to that point where uh, you know, it's ready to go proceed to the next level. And I'll also add that there are ways to uh, transition between agencies between phases. So for example, in a phase one with MSF, for example, phase two, you're ready for the clinical trial. There are ways for you to apply the NIH for your phase two. Phase right. Two. Right, so yeah, and NIH definitely has more flexibility and you can go directly to phase two, although you can't do that with NSF. Right, right. Thank you.